Let's do it then. So here's something that didn't make our thing last week. We were we had this on our list, but we, we went on for so long about other interesting things that we didn't get this in. Sometimes that happens on the show. We don't just say everything that we, we've thought in the week. Sometimes we mostly do. But uh, it was 13F season, and we haven't talked about them just yet. And normally we would let this pass, but I felt this was not okay because um, there's special reason to talk about 13Fs this this particular season that there isn't in a usual one, especially the Berkshire Hathaway uh, one. So Berkshire Hathaway's 13F was reported as usual on the 13F reporting date uh, deadline, um, and their 13F indicated larger than the previous quarter, end of previous quarter positions in the following stocks. HP, Occidental, Apple, Bank of America, Markel, Citigroup, Paramount, Capital One, Diageo, and Vitesse Energy. Uh, we'll come back to what they sold in a moment, but there's quite a bit going on there, and there were lots of interesting things, and this caught lots of people's attention, and it absolutely wrong-footed a number of very good people, uh, and me as well, but uh, not everybody here. Steve, take a bow. Uh, yeah. Would you like to say what happened here, or would you like me to do it? Well, I will pass it back to you, but it's just a key little uh, learning for everybody is that when you see something and it doesn't really make sense, it's always best just to check the press releases that come out with it as well because sometimes there's a small explanation in there. And Steve, I think you've got a, a rough copy of that, have you? Yeah, uh, so I don't have the copy of it, but I can tell you what it said. Here's what it comes down to. Berkshire, as uh, Berkshire shareholders will know, owns an insurance company called General Re. General Re owns an asset management company called New England Asset Management, uh, or NEAM, or NEAM. I'm not sure whether it's an acronym or an initialism. I'm going to call it NEAM for the moment. NEAM has historically filed its own 13F, consisting of a combination of things it's invested in and things it holds for its customers, being an asset management uh, company. And but uh, as a subsidiary of Berkshire, they've now decided that they're going to uh, file some of that stuff into and incorporate that stuff into the Berkshire 13F. Uh, so some of the increase there is just things that were part of Neem, which is part of Genry, which is part of Berkshire, now being listed on the Berkshire uh, thing. There was no actual buying going on there. It's just a difference in, I guess, a difference in what you might call accounting, basically. Mm. And the things that uh, fall into that category were HP. Apple, Bank of America, Markel, Citigroup, and Diageo. So several people there, including me, got kind of wrong-footed a little bit. Uh, I was writing about this for The Motley Fool, um, and I thought, okay, there's some things here that make sense to me and some things that don't make sense to me. So bear in mind this is covering the period between January and March, basically beginning of January to end of March. I thought an increase in Apple does make sense based on where that was at the start of the year. That was under 150 not a huge surprise to me to find out Berkshire might have added to its stake there. Tick. Uh, Bank of America and Citigroup went down as big surprises uh, to me, given that at the uh, shareholder meeting, Buffett had said, I don't like the outlook for banks. It looks way too uncertain and had been selling out of, uh, well, various banks, including US Bancorp and so on. Uh, so to find the idea that it added to B of A and City was surprising. It's less surprising when you discover that he wasn't doing that. And the big one that made no sense to me at all, uh, although I assumed it wasn't a Buffett thing, was Diageo. Uh, we have talked at great length uh, on this podcast about how Diageo looks an awful lot like a Buffett stock. Um, it looks like it because it has strong brands. It's a consumer facing thing. It's got top selling products in various categories. I think brands probably do matter uh, in this context, to be honest. But um, equally, it's nowhere near at the kind of prices that Buffett buys these things at. And it's well known because the previous points are, are pretty darn obvious. It trades at, I, I can't remember now, but the last time I looked, it was around 26 or maybe more times earnings. I don't think Buffett's buying Apple at 26 times earnings, let alone uh, Diageo. And I think the growth prospects there are, are much, much better. Um, there's a couple of other bits we might kind of come back to uh, there, but... Um, I saw this reported, I think, incorrectly in good places like the Times, like on the FT. I had a nice article written explaining my confusion about some of these things and not about other things. And then Steve said, have you seen this? Just as I was about to whack it to send to the copy editors. Uh, and I looked at it and thought, let's change that uh, in that case. So, uh, Steve, so put this way, this has um, slid past the attention of good journalists it has slid past the attention of lousy Poundland writers like me. 
Um, but Steve got this one, uh, and he managed to stop me from looking like a complete idiot, uh, and no doubt attracting yet more criticism uh, at uh, Motley Fool. So, uh, round of applause for for Steve here. His um, this kind of attention to detail will be useful to him in his future parenting career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like David Cameron leaving my children at the pub and things like that. I'll be <laughs> yeah, I'll be well on the ball. But yeah, Steve, I did. I, I always tend to read things like that because I can't see. Um, a Buffett or Munger or any sort of the proteges buying Diageo, so I had to go figure out why it made why it made sense. It's like make it make sense to me why anyone would buy this, and and I think the uh, the reason why people like the Times etc have run with it is because they're so desperate to say that somebody like Buffett would invest in a Diageo. Somebody like Buffett thinks that the UK market is cheap, and look at Buffett buying this, look at Buffett buying that, and. And I just thought, sadly, that doesn't really seem like the case to me. I think if you were going to come over here and buy something, if you were Buffett, let alone that he could accidentally sneeze and buy the whole of most companies <laughs> over here, um, I just thought Diageo was probably the most unremarkable of the sort of companies that he could he could snap up. So I was very suspicious of it, which I think that's one of the sort of tricks you need in investing, is that to be suspicious of absolutely everything. Uh, and... Um, and yeah, and just a quick nose, uh, found the press release and, and there it was in, in, in plain English. Yep. Uh, just to, to try and restore some of my own credibility here, the January name thing wasn't entirely unknown to me. The reporting shift caught me off guard. Uh, but I had previously written, and I guess I can make this available if anyone wants to read it, um, this really great piece that I thought would be terrific for uh Motley Fool at first, and then I thought it'd be rubbish for Motley Fool, but it's an intrinsically good bit of writing about how Buffett had been selling Coke shares, uh, which he has not, uh, out of the, um, the the main Berkshire portfolio. And it's also worth pointing out that Buffett doesn't operate the Neem portfolio that's run by their own kind of asset managers. But as I made the point in there, um, they have been selling uh, Coca-Cola shares at least a couple of quarters ago, uh, and they let those go at whatever price they let them go at. And I think that while it's one thing to point out that no, Buffett isn't actively managing that portfolio, it's run by other people. If you think they are floating entirely independent of uh, what Berkshire thinks um, and so on, you are dreaming. Um, their biggest holding is Apple. Their second biggest holding is Bank of America. Uh, there are some generally sort of familiar themes coming through uh, with this. There's a lot of uh, similarity and a lot of overlap. But the fact that they were letting Coca-Cola shares go, thereby reducing Buffett's stake as Buffett is an owner of Berkshire, is an owner of Genry, is an owner of Neem, uh, in Coca-Cola, I thought was quite significant. Uh, Buffett said he'll never sell, sell a share of Coke, and I believe him, because Berkshire's cost base is so low that the tax on it would be ridiculous that they would be better advised to sit there and keep the dividends. But my take-home point from that was, in the view of Berkshire Hathaway as a whole, uh, and probably Buffett by extension, Coke is overpriced. Uh, so don't just go buying that stock because you think, great, I'm going to build a kind of Buffett type uh, portfolio here. The fact that a subsidiary of Berkshire is selling out of that stock or reducing in that stock, I can't remember which it was now, uh, spoke to me to the idea that um, actually Buffett would sell this if he could do it in a tax efficient way. And he exactly. can't. And that probably makes it the right thing not to. But uh, yeah. Yeah, there's no sense in selling Coke for Buffett now because his cost base is so low, you'll end up with a huge tax bill for selling it. So, uh, Interestingly, Steve, I've just finished reading Poor Charlie's Almanac, which is Charlie Munger's uh, like anthology, and um, he's got uh, 11 or eleven or 12, no, 11 talks in there um, that he's given over the years, are be his best 11 talks, and then he, at the end of each talk, he has a small section where he reviews it and sees if there's anything he would change or add to it. And in one of the talks, he gives uh, a speech to um, just a bunch of Harvard, which he, he has real disdain for universities. It's quite interesting. He has a disdain for a lot of things. Uh, but uh, he basically explains how nobody can, ha nobody from Harvard will ever be able to go and make another Coca-Cola again because they have um, like a, a just a single discipline uh, approach and not a multidisciplinary approach. And he goes through, you know, how they needed biology, how they needed psychology, how they needed business acumen. In how they needed marketing, how they needed advertising to make Coke the brand that it is today. And in there, bear in mind this talk was from 20 years ago, he predicts that 
earnings only need to increase. I think it's by six and a half, but it might be by eight percent. I can't remember the exact figure, but earnings only need to increase at cut by six and a half to eight percent for it to be uh, a trillion dollar company by 2035. And uh, I was running the maths on that, Stephen. That's not a million miles away from uh, uh, where Coke has actually since gone over those 20 years as well. A, a slow and steady compounder. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was uh, that, that was really interesting. It's, it is a really good book, but you've got to be able to get it shipped to you at the moment, which costs you about 80 odd quid from America. There is a new version coming on Amazon and I have checked it out. It is a condensed version of the book. It has less of the family things and the uh, Munger and friends talking about things and um, Charlie just sort of wax lyrical in on a uh, bits and pieces here and there, but it has the talks in which might be worth picking up because uh, from what I understand, it's going to be uh, quite a bit cheaper, maybe about 11 or 12 pound for the hardcover, which is probably worth it. Yeah, probably is. Is it out yet, Steve, did you say, or is it coming out? November. November, excellent. So one for the Christmas list rather than the birthday list for me. My mm. birthday's in uh, August, and if, no, not that far away from friend of the show, Casper's. I think he's either a day earlier or a day later uh, than me. But I will be looking out for that. Um, there was just a little bit of action on the sort of selling side that caught my eye from Berkshire Hathaway. They sold more than they bought, but uh, one that stood out, or two that stood out to me, I guess, one was Activision Blizzard, which we've talked about in some some detail. There was a bunch of stuff from banks, uh, but it's also, I noticed, a reduction in Chevron. The reason that stuck out to me is twofold. One is that Chevron was a big, big part of that uh, stock portfolio before, still is. Uh, the other is that Chevron was one of the companies that, um, one of the stocks, sorry, that was partly acquired from Neem. Uh, so actually for that to see that go down on balance means there was some quite significant uh, selling going on there, as well as some known buying into into Occidental. Um, don't know much about what to think of that, Steve, but it looks like an increasingly kind of sophisticated uh, oil move from Buffett, I suppose. Yeah, strange one really, isn't it? It's, he's taken about 33% of the uh, position away from about just under 10 to just about 6.65%. Mm. So. It's quite a significant sale, and he was buying it up until last quarter, I seem to remember as well. So it, it is a, a definite change in how he feels about uh, this kind of market. So I, I'm not entirely sure, Steve. Maybe he's worried about this massive buyback taking him over the 10% reporting uh, limit. It's possible, I guess. Um, might well be the case. I I haven't got much new 